So for those that are on the move, and for those that are just seeking, welcome. Here's a show for you. Welcome to another episode of Matt Chat Live. Hi, I'm Teresa Quinlan, and I'm here to talk about emotional intelligence. So what I do on a professional level and a personal level is really not much different from each other. I focus on building emotional intelligence in individuals with executive coaching and leadership development. Because something interesting I found along my own journey is that EQ is that missing link to higher performance, greater well-being. And so I have a personal brand that is IQ plus our EQ equals our TQ, which is our talent quotient. That's leveraging all of our strengths while being very mindful of these blind spots that we experience in life. So if you want more in your emotional intelligence journey, you can get in touch with me on LinkedIn and you can visit me at my website, www.iqeqtq.com. Hey everybody, this is Matt Krupp here with Matt Chat Live. I'm super, super excited to have my friend Teresa here today, who is some serious emotional intelligence, serious guru, superhero, power chick lady, awesome person, <laughs> who has an incredible website. Yeah, the great Teresa. And I'm super glad to have you here today. I, uh, I've had times in the past where emotional intelligence uh, gives me a headache, blows my mm. mind. <laughs> and then, then there's you. And you have the opportunity to share some things about it that I believe is a way that breaks it down for a dummy like me to say, I get what you're saying. And uh, I really appreciate that about you today and what you do. So we're going to break it down today too for everybody else, right? Yes, we totally are. Because I think the most important thing is that it's accessible to people because it really is. And it's, it's just a little tricky sometimes when we read through the literature to go, well, how do I do that? So that's what hopefully we're going to talk about in some really critical areas is how do you actually do it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, in the light of everything we've been going through in our culture, in the world, in the past six months, eight months or so, uh, there's no doubt this has been stressed in everybody's life. It's seen across the board in so many different ways. Everybody knows. Um, so to really take a deeper dive into what that looks like as far as emotional intelligence is concerned, yeah. uh, it's a, it's uh, professionally, uh, personally, in mm -hmm. families, right, as well. I mean, everything we're going to discuss today is, is a deep dive internally that produces an external result much better than we're seeing in many cases in the world today, right? So yeah. just looking at, I know what our notes are for today, so just looking at our notes we've been talking about, if we would just do some of this stuff, yeah. things would be a bit different, right? Very different, actually. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you have them. They're called the, uh, the four key EQ skills, right? That surround desperation, kind of that emotional experience. And, and folks have some kinds of uh, sometimes rash decision making and they throw out all kinds of wild answers or results or, or maybe they, they act or uh, not act, react rather than an act, right? I think there's two different, two different points. Mm -hmm. And we, we see a lot of reaction today um, in many, many different ways with desperation, fear, um, anger, violence, I mean, across the board, right? So we've got four areas we're going to talk about today. I'll say what those four titles are real fast, and we'll come back into them individually. One is impulse control. Um, two, flexibility. We're not talking about yoga here, although it might be helpful. Yeah. Oh, look at that girl. She's, I, oh, I, my shoulders. Oh, I can't do that. Oh, Matt. <laughs> you know, sorry. All right, the last one is, now I need this one, stress tolerance. <laughs> and then number four is assertiveness, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so let's jump back into number one in this, uh, in this series of four key EQ skills for folks today, for all of us. Uh, impulse control. What's that all about? Well, maybe, and maybe even before we sort of jump straight to that one is, clarifying a little bit around, you know, the foundation of, of all these four EQ skills is our emotional self-awareness. So first we have to know we're experiencing something like desperation. And you mentioned a few critical components. Desperation can come out of being fearful, 
being angry. And so desperation can often feel like a response emotion to other emotions going on in the background. Desperation is a combination emotion, fear, anger, plus hopelessness. So grief, sadness, we add those in combination to each other. We have desperation. So we have multiple points contributing and our capacity and emotional self-awareness <laughs> means First, we know we're experiencing it, so we're in tune with our body, which means we can recognize the physical signs. Then we're in tune with our thoughts, so we can recognize the conditioned thinking that goes along with desperation. And we're paying attention to our behaviors that signal we are desperate because we're used to seeing ourselves behave in this way based on this emotion, based on these thoughts. So if we aren't emotionally self-aware, then it's actually really quite difficult to access impulse control, flexibility. It's difficult to, to access these other four that then help us resolve the emotion of desperation and the behaviors that come out of it so we can do better. So, I mean, we're not really talking about how do I develop my emotional self-awareness, but really it's like watch yourself like a hawk, pay attention and start cataloging what triggers me, what are the things that trigger me? What's the emotion I experience? Then how do I behave and what am I thinking about? And then we have to challenge the behavior and thinking part because when we challenge those things, then we start to feel different. And when we feel different, now we've got emotional choices based out of our triggers. Right now we're conditioned for one choice, one reaction, one behavior, one mode of thinking, one outcome. And what we want in emotional intelligence is we want to broaden that spectrum so now I can respond instead of react. Yeah, so if you have road rage, this yep. doesn't come so easy. You're not just going to jump right into impulse control. When you're in road rage, you want to kill the person in front of you, right? It's a great example, right? But, you know, the question is why? Like, why yeah. do you care how someone else is driving? Why did you tell the story that they're out to get you? Why are you playing a victim and assigning them the villain role? You have no idea what might be going on for them. So, you know, impulse control is that ability to resist or delay that um, reaction to temptation to behave rashly in our decision making, really. And this is a power EQ skill. When we Gosh, it is. I'm thinking, it. Teresa, it's so hard. I mean, what you just said sounds so fantastic. Right. But girl, really, I'm like, when you're like already like, boop, I mean, yeah. and what you're talking about is, is, is having these tools already in your toolbox and not even get, allowing yourself to get to that point, which takes, which takes time, discipline, effort, Definitely. right? Yeah, it, like, takes, it takes a lot cow. of time. It's any, yeah. like any skill, right? You and I didn't jump on a bicycle the first time and do the Tour de France. We <laughs> needed time to learn how to balance, to manage our speed, to brake, to make turns without falling over. Like we needed to practice. And emotional intelligence, it's skill sets. So we need time to practice them and put them into play and receive feedback and reflect on how we did and try better next time. And it is a process. For some of us, we'll be able to break some of those habits relatively quickly because sometimes it's a matter of turning on a switch and choosing, I will no longer respond in anger when I drive. But consider, Matt, how many years we've been driving, how many years we've been in a vehicle and watched other people demonstrate road rage. And so we are conditioned quite deeply sometimes into our response pattern, which doesn't mean that it's going to be hard to get out of. It means we need to give ourselves permission to get out of it because we will. We just have to stay focused on the goal we're that's, aiming for. Yeah, that's so easy. That's awesome. Yeah. I so think about easy. that old that TV curse from it's so easy, it's so easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. But it is possible. Nothing's impossible. It's possible if you choose to go that direction, right? And that's yeah. really what this is all about. And we're we're going through those steps. So the, the, what I love about this value right now for folks is honestly, guys, gals, if you're out there listening right now and you know, crap, they're, they're calling me out, right? And you're going to hear some other stuff in a minute. Um, this is a great opportunity to say, I want to take some of these things and apply them into my life and, and, and start changing, right? I mean, it's, it's yeah. possible to change. It's possible to shift. It's mindset, right? But it's, it is, it's an opportunity mm -hmm. to make a difference. All right. So I'm I'm loving this. All right. So we're at impulse control. You got some more impulse control. You're ready to go to flexibility. No, right. More impulse control. So I oh, love it. This is considered a power EQ skill because just consider what does it feel like when someone interrupts us when we're speaking? It's like an assault on our brain. And so impulse control is. What do you mean? I know what you're talking about, Teresa. What do you mean when somebody interrupts you when you're trying? 
it's a good thing I have EQ developed, right? Because I'm I love it. You're it's hysterical. It's on, it's on play right it's here. Hysterical. All right. <laughs> Even something like that 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 assault on our brain that occurs and so how do we practice impulse control it's basically our ability to wait pause stop delay it's giving ourselves the appropriate amount of time to neutralize our emotional state because we have to recognize we're not in the right one for the decision we need to be making <laughs> and yeah. then um so how we build impulse control is by tweaking the dial in our current behavior so Something as simple as if we're used to responding quickly to an email comes in and we get our alert or our phone buzzes and a text has come in and we're used to grabbing it and responding straight away. That is a lack of impulse control. Mm. And so how we tweak the dial on just building that skill itself in something as simple as responding to technology is we start by giving ourselves five minutes before we respond to the ding. 10 minutes next week, the week after 15 minutes. And what we start to see is we start to see our, yep. You're calling me so hard. I'm like, oh Matt, but this God. is why we tweak the dial. Don't try to go all the way. I'm going to wait an hour. I'm going to wait 24 hours because that's like running uphill at the peak of um, Mount Everest. Like yeah. we won't be able to do it. It's setting ourselves up for failure. So if you even need to start it, I'm going to start at a minute, then start at a minute. And what you'll notice in that minute is you'll notice the emotion rise, the emotion of frustration, irritation, annoyance, whatever emotion we're experiencing. Like the, the ones one I'm feeling right now as you're talking. Right. We don't want to feel it, right? We don't want to feel it. And so what do we do? We behave in a way that stops the emotional experience. Well, what we need to do is we need to you get used to the fact that I'm not responding to the emotion. What I'm responding to is the trigger. And I've conditioned myself that this trigger is a bad trigger. I've labeled it. So now I experience an unpleasant emotion from it. And then I associate meaning and thoughts to that unpleasant emotion. If we give ourselves 30 seconds to take a breath, maybe two or three or four, what we're going to notice is the emotion peaks and it rolls back down the other side and it shifts. And when it shifts, then we're ready to look because when we're ready to look at the text, the email, respond to the person who cut off, we're in the right emotional state for the correct decision to make at that time that we then don't regret, don't beat ourselves up about, don't feel shame for, like all of these things at the end of it are mostly harmful to ourselves as well as being harmful to people around us. Wow. Shift happens. Yeah. Yeah. It sure does. That's amazing. I mean, obviously, you took me through a journey of things that I have to deal with. Too. I have been. The one thing I'm thinking about before we even get to the next spot, which I think is probably flexibility. Uh, yep. It goes both ways from what I'm about to say. Um, how do I say this? So when you're trying to make some of these shifts in your life, right, and trying to, to maybe pause or do some things, how do, you come, how do you do this without coming across looking like a jerk maybe to somebody else? So for example, uh, thinking about like the technique of mirroring, right? Like you just mm -hmm. said, blah, blah, blah. And I say, oh, so what you just said to me is blah, blah, blah. And oh, no. I, so sometimes another person that comes across like, are you, are you demeaning me right now? Are you mocking me? Are you, are you trying to, now you're making the other person feel like crap, right? right? So, I mean, how can you make some of these adjustments? I mean, of course, I'm thinking about my wife with marriage, but when it comes to, forget marriage, but let's talk about at the office. I mean, you're not married to these people, so it's not the mm -hmm. same relationship. But then you've got these things that go through some of these people's minds that they're not going to say out loud, right? My wife might just tell me straight up, you're being a jerk or whatever, right? But these people right. may not say that, right? So if you understand what I'm saying, how can you, how can you um, work on that in, internally so that it doesn't really, it's not so brash, so sudden, such like, what, is, what did he just do? Why did he do that, right? Yeah. We have to learn some back pocket, like we need some back pocket cards. They're basically statements that we use when we're in a moment where we're trying to get ourselves right. And we want need to communicate that appropriately to the other person. For example, something like saying, Ooh, I, I need a second with that. And so you audibly tell the other person like the, Ooh, when we say something like, Ooh, I need a second with that is a, is a signal to them that something's going on here and everyone can understand that it's almost universal when we do you that. share that you share that trigger moment that 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 statement with the other person so they know that you you're don't working need to. you don't need to share why you need a moment but you could just ask for the moment really 
And because what you're doing is you're giving yourself time and space and alerting the other person that you need time and space. And no, what I, I'm saying is like, if you, could you tell the other person, like I'm working on internal stuff, working on my emotional intelligence. And there may be some times I'm going to say, Ooh, I need a moment. And yes. when I do, it's just, I'm trying to process so that they, if you do it for the first time, the person goes like, you need a moment. We talk about, you need a moment. I should talk to you be right now. Right. You get what I'm saying? So, I mean, you yeah, should have, yeah. if you have some of those back, back pocket things, you should probably share them with certain people. So they don't Absolutely. think you're a, a crazy jerk idiot <laughs> like me. No, I think that's an amazing idea. So yes, to your point, the people that you're going to be practicing with perhaps are the, you know, ones you feel the safest practicing with, let them know what you're working on and what you're trying to shift. And even perhaps that you're open to feedback from them in, you know, how am I doing in, in my impulse control in not interrupting in meetings? We set that up because we often need accountability partners to be able to encourage and support us in our journey. And generally we ask people we know have our best interests in heart who are willing to help us. Not the ones that are going to point it out and go, oh, you suck. You're not doing it. Like we don't want those people as our accountability partners. They're right, not there right. to help us. Yeah. They're there to harm. <laughs> yeah. No doubt. Yeah. Well, that's fantastic news. That's good stuff. Um, at least it is for me. Hopefully there's other people out there like me right now that are listening going, oh man, yeah, me too, right? This is yeah, good, yeah. this is good. So that's yeah. a fantastic way. So impulse control, I love the, the, uh, the back pocket, the card in the back pocket thing you said there. Really great idea. I mean, that's a great idea, folks, to write down some, mm -hmm. of, those, some of those key words or key triggers for yourself so you can practice with yourself. Um, it yeah. doesn't take much. I mean, you can practice with yourself by yourself when you do get a ding on your phone and it's a message and you're like, nobody else is around. You could look at your phone or you could say, oh, oh, breathe, Matt, breathe. Don't look at your phone. Don't look at your phone. Stop. Put it down. Put it down. <laughs> That's right. So. Maybe even your screensaver is the word wait. Like you can set yourself up for success and technology gives us many opportunities. Like turn the dings off, period. Like if you don't want to be- Ding, bat, don't look. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If you don't want to be interrupted or be, you know, at beck and call to your technology because that's where you find like, oh, this is really derailing me, then turn all the notifications off. You yeah. know it's there. You can always look when you want to look, when you decide right. to look. Yeah, they're, yeah. they're never going to go away. They're always going to yeah. be there waiting. The waiting Very for you to answer, I know fantastic this is great all right so flexibility let's talk about flexibility so you know you're right it, i love that we're not we're not talking about how bendy are we how stretchy are we but how adaptable are we right so darwin is like survival of the fittest and what he really meant by that was the one who was most capable of adapting to what was happening around them so if we think about how does impulse control is our pause and wait because we are processing the reaction emotion with the intention of adjusting and adapting to the one we need to be experiencing in the moment. So regulating the emotion. So we need that time to be able to do that. And flexibility then gives us based on what's happening around us, something unpredictable, unexpected, unfamiliar. And so it kind of takes us off guard. Flexibility is then learning what is the best emotional state for me to be in for the task at hand. So like what I've learned in my emotional intelligence journey is when I need to do analytical work, I need to be experiencing thoughtfulness as an emotion, which is a relatively like low energy, pleasant feeling emotion. It's because when I'm in thoughtfulness, it's when I'm focused, my energy is average, I'm not bouncing all over the place. So concentration is highest for me. And that means I'm meticulous and detail oriented. So when I'm doing analytical work, that's what I need to be in. And I know how to get myself in that mood. I do a puzzle or two, word searches, word finds, uh, even crossword puzzles, because that shifts my energy to that thoughtful section. It takes me maybe three minutes to engage in that activity to get me into, oh, now I can do analytical work. Because if I try to do analytical work right after a workout and a, a power meal, my energy is way too high. I miss important things. You know, like, this will take care of itself. <laughs> like way too optimistic. And <laughs> the analytical work, there's errors. I miss important things. So flexibility is our, it really is our power EQ skill around shifting to the emotion we need to be in, not the one we currently are responding in. Woohoo, that's big stuff right there. Let's all right, unpack that just a little bit. Okay, yeah. that's pretty good stuff. Uh, and you know what's really funny? My wife, if she ever listens to this thing, oh my Lord, I'll be dead. But all right, so she, she comes to bed with her phone and she plays these um, 
these little games where she has to, it's like Tetris kind of thing. I don't know what it is. It looks, it's a white screen with blue things. She makes, anyway, she just does all the stuff. My wife's very jot and tittle, very across the board. She's very, she's very detailed. She's an executive at a hospital, right? So when she comes home, she does this because it's what, it's what slows her brain down from all the crap and puts her into a place where she can deal with this crazy guy now, right? So she, oh, I'm going to talk to Matt. Let me get myself down to, down here. <laughs> so, right. So, but she does that, and it's it's for her. I mean, for me, I'm like, what the freak are you doing? I mean, I don't get. What you're, I mean, I can I can watch TV and be fine like that, but she's got to. So it's that's what you're saying. It's finding that place to to bring yourself down to a place where you can think a little bit clearer, declutter uh, from, from the day, the moment, the activity, whatever, and then act, uh, well, act with thoughtfulness, act with a place of intelligence where you could actually hear somebody say something. It, it, it's not a reaction from something you just went through or your day or whatever. Yeah, because, you know, originally we're talking about the emotional response of desperation, which, you know, anger, fear, and grief or sadness all rolled into one. So if I'm experiencing that and I'm acting in desperation, then generally I'm making unhelpful, unwise decisions in that moment. And most people out of desperation will make decisions that are not the right decision that they would make if they were in a different emotional state. So the impulse control gives us the time and space to go, whoa, hang on a second, what's happening here? The flexibility then requires us to unpack the little bit of the whoa, what's happening here and go, oh, okay, I understand I'm angry and I'm also experiencing loss. Why am I experiencing those kinds of things? Like we have to unpack what and why we're feeling what we're feeling until we get to a space of like, okay, I understand that. Now for what I'm trying to do, what is the best course of action for here? What is the best emotional state for me to bring myself into? And how do I want to go about getting myself to that state? Could be, yeah, video game, could be a puzzle, could be watching TV, could be that I need two minutes of a conversation with my kid because my kid creates a certain kind of energy for me. Could be that I want two minutes of mindfulness or meditation because that also does it. Could be that I want to jack up my favorite song because what I need to do is I need to jack up my energy, right? So you have to know what state do I want and what gets me there. Mm, That's so amazing. So I'm thinking about executives, CEOs, um, you know, I've been a business owner, a CEO, things of that nature too. And I deal with people and I know that's what you do as well. That's how you, you, that's really where your bread and butter comes from is in that field. So a lot of executives and CEOs, not all of them, but a lot of them are, are 125 miles an hour Mm -hmm. and, and squirreling and flying at 50,000 feet. And to come into that place is like, are you kidding me? I don't have the time to do that right now because I've got all this going on, which is really hard to change. Now there are some CEOs again, there are some that are down doing what you're saying. They've trained themselves Absolutely. to that and now their businesses are probably, I mean, they're probably, they are way better than they were before. Yes. So I mean, gosh, so for an executive, a CEO that's saying, yeah, it sounds great, Teresa, but you have no idea what I'm going through during the day and how many things I've got to do during the day and this, that, and the other, and to sit down and do that little oh, oh, thing. I don't have time for that kind of crap. Okay, you really do, but how do you, how do you make that shift? It is allowing them to explore what is the current state of affairs. Because the reason they're coming to work on their emotional intelligence is because they're experiencing pain points that they would like to remove. And those pain points are getting them into trouble, whether they are high stress, whether they are creating toxic cultures because of their behavior, whether turnover is high, whether employee wellness is low. I mean, in the CEO position, you set the cultural tone. So if you're behaving in these ways and your bottom line numbers are not good across the board, you're the one setting the tone for it. We often wonder, you know, the leaders here aren't doing a really good job. Well, who are the leaders watching? They're watching the leaders who are watching the leaders who eventually are watching the CEO or the president, right? Yeah. And so, you know, we do explore the, how does your natural state help you? And how, how and when does your natural state hinder you? And we become aware of when it's a hindrance and we amp up the EQ skills that balance it out. And a really primary example, because assertiveness is one of the things we're going to be talking about is, 
in emotional intelligence, we balance assertiveness and empathy. They have to live in the same balance in every interaction. So I am understanding your perspective and responding with respect to your perspective, while I am also stating my beliefs, thoughts, defending my personal rights and values in a non-destructive, non-offensive manner. If we live in that space, we have conversation, dialogue, problem solving, collaboration, co-creation. Every workplace is asking for those things, and yet not everyone is willing to balance listening and talking. So is that an unconscious incompetence at that point? I think it's an unconscious yeah. incompetence, right? So sometimes, they, don't, but, they don't know that they are doing it? Yeah, so how, and sometimes how do you it's take that? Yeah, how do you, right, subconsciously for sure. But how can you make that a conscious go out and take somebody like you, somebody, it takes an external force to make an internal difference, right? So if you had that unconscious incompetence, you don't know about it, then it, to become a conscious competence, mm -hmm. um, then it takes something like what we're talking about to make that difference. Otherwise, it's never going to change. Very true. And people are great mirrors for us and give us lots of feedback all the time. So if we're willing to pay attention to what other people are telling us with their verbal and nonverbal cues, <laughs> yeah. then we'll probably very quickly start to notice, ooh, I might be doing something that's rubbing them the wrong way. I wonder so how does, the, how does the general manager, the, yeah. the, the manager, talk to the CEO who has these issues? And he's not aware, but everybody's talking about it. And it's yeah. not healthy for the environment. So now finally, oh my God, it's me. I've got to go talk to Billy or Sarah. I've got to go tell them this, right? Holy smokes, how do you how do you make that shift and to tell them, um, Mr. Mrs. CEO? Yeah. Well, we do it um not with hesitation, <laughs> with uh we inch our way forward. In my opinion, it depends on your relationship with the individual. If you have a solid relationship with, relationship with them already and you put cards on the table on a regular basis, then just yeah. go in and have the conversation with much them. Much right? easier then, much easier. Absolutely. Yeah. If you don't have an established relationship with them, then you're, you're asking permission. You're approaching with curiosity. You're, um, you use tentative language like, are you aware? This is what I observed. Um, have you experienced? And, and we pose it in this way that engages a conversation and a curious dialogue. And the first time we do it, it might be met with anger and like, how dare you? And it could be met with some sort of distressful response. And that, that's okay. Don't take that personally, number one, because it isn't that's, about- That's really hard to not take it personally. It but if you go in prepared- hard. Yeah, if you go and yeah, prepare with what you're saying, that's another story. Yes. It's, it's not about you, but just think about any time we've received feedback and we get our backup immediately because, you know, we take it as a personal attack. Like, I'm not, think of the internal dialogue. I'm not good enough. I did something wrong. Oh my goodness, I can't believe it. Who are you to give me feedback? Like, the internal dialogue is fast and furious. Yes. And sometimes that internal dialogue comes out fast and furious and you're just happen to be the one in front of them. And so what is often great about that is the more times you drop those nuggets of I'm trying to be helpful I'm trying to be helpful as long as you're resilient I'm trying to be helpful you drop the nuggets what you'll start to see is the other person will start to pick them up but it's very rare that it happens in one interaction so we have to be willing to keep stepping back into that conversation over and over and over again until the other person goes oh my god thank you so much yeah, yeah. I, I wouldn't see that it's going to be a one-stop shop for sure. No. But to have the opportunity to, to, to share something like that, which makes everything better all the way around, you know, it's, it's a highly important thing to do. And I, I think a lot of people are, are afraid to do something like that because let's face it, this happens a lot in a lot of places. And a lot yeah. of folks are just afraid to do it. Even if you have a relationship, it's still kind of weird to have to go that way. You know, when at the end of the day, yeah. if it's the CEO, they're like, you know what, Matt, you're fired. Oh my God, I was just trying to know that. Doesn't, <laughs> <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah, or, you might have to be willing to accept the consequences that come with it. And, oh you know, that's Lord, weighing, yeah. that is weighing the pros and cons sometimes too, is, is this a moment where I want to step in, where there's a high risk that I'm going to lose my job? Is this a moment where I'm just going to like, you know what, I'm, I can... I can tolerate that. I can be resilient to you. Or even sometimes we're like, nope, that's a boundary that's crossed and I'm leaving. I'm choosing to leave. If, 
if they or he or she doesn't want to, as CEO, leader, whomever, own and be responsible for their shit, for lack of a better term, yeah. then I don't want to work here. I didn't sign up for this. This is not what they wrote on the wall, nor is it what I learned about this company from the website or from the interview process. And so now I'm in it and this is what it is. That's not what I signed up for. Oh, that's so good, Teresa. And you just took a turn and pulled it right back to the person uh, versus the CEO. And I think that's so important. There are times like that. And it's scary right now, uh, definitely with Corona and, and knowing that there may not be another job, period. Mm -hmm. um, that's really scary to have to, to make that kind of a choice when you're, you're working in fear at that point because you got nothing else to do. So you just keep doing it, but it's really just killing you at the same time. So it's just not worth it. It causes too many other problems. All right. So we, we camped out there for quite a while, which has been pretty fun, which yeah. leads right into the next one. It's pretty awesome. Stress tolerance. Oh man. It's one of my favorites. I mean, talk about needing powerful coping strategies. And I love this topic because our ability to handle stressful or difficult situations comes from believing that we can manage it, that we can influence it in a positive way. And I love this topic so much because there is so much we can do from a proactive standpoint with our stress management and our stress tolerance. We have pillars that help us to manage our stress better. And they're really simple. And everyone listening has heard these before. Sleep, exercise, nutrition, meditation, mindfulness, gratitude, strong relationships where we are supported and loved. Those are like seven critical pieces to automatically building our resiliency when things get difficult. And if we don't have those things, it's kind of easy to start tweaking the dial a little bit at a time to doing those things on a regular basis in ways that suit us best. So like my sister is a guru of meditation. She could sit for 30 minutes. She did a weekend silent retreat. There's like, there's no way. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will do 10 minute guided meditations on occasion because I like the guided where someone is keeping, helping me to stay focused. Keeping your focus, yeah, yeah. Yes, that's right. And, and I much prefer mindfulness on a regular basis. I mindful practice when I'm brushing my teeth, washing the dishes, running. When I'm doing things I don't have to really pay attention to because I've done them so much, I could be on autopilot with this and do a mindfulness exercise. So what's that mindfulness, brushing your teeth, mindfulness, mindfulness exercise? What, what's that? Mindfulness is about being in the present moment, about only allowing the mind and the body to be in where I am right now. Nothing else. So nothing else. So it is consistently catching your, your mind wandering, which our minds are built to do. So catching it and bringing it back to, I'm brushing the fifth molar on the top. Like it basically is bringing ourselves into the exactness of what we're doing. And my eyes are, are soft and I, I do a scan of my body. My, my stomach has a little knot in it. Take a deep breath into the stomach, release the knot. So it's just about being present in the body and the mind. Gosh, I'm such a squirrel. <laughs> like, I told him to pick out, I told him to pick the garbage up out there earlier today and he left the, the thing I just tripped over in the garage and I'm, oh my, oh, oh. right? So, and I got a, I got a friend, you, you probably know him too. His name's Ash Playstead. He's out in, the, in Australia and his whole focus is mindset. His whole, everything he talks about is mindset, which is so very powerful. Uh, he could probably very talk for an hour about brushing, brushing your teeth, right? But uh, <laughs> But uh, that's a great, great point. So those are the ways you can practice mindset mindfulness um, in those Proactive. areas. Proactively, you say? Yeah, that's proactive practicing for stress management strategies and stress tolerance. Those yeah, things so little things like brushing your teeth helps you to do stuff like when you're at the office. Like you can... Proper sleep and exercise, nutrition, gratitude. Like those are practices we do that are proactive. It's like we do these things and they help us put on the armor to stressful events. Those things just kind of ding on off of us. We don't sweat the small stuff. Really. Yeah, that's good. In the, the army, I was in the army, we would say whatever we do in practice, we do in war. Yes, ex that's exactly it, Matt. And then we'll have moments where something unexpected happens and we can feel the stress rising. We can feel the cortisol enter our system and all of a sudden we're on high alert because we're in fight flight or freeze mode. So our whole body goes in high alert. 
And things that are powerful in the moment are mantras and affirmations, like this too shall pass. You're okay in this moment. You can do this because a strength of mine is. Like I can do this, I can manage this because a strength of mine is patience. And I remind myself, I've got skills. I can handle this right now. So mantras and affirmations are really powerful in the moment to help that cortisol, which spikes us to regulate us and bring our breathing and our heart rate and our blood pressure back to normal. Mm, that's so good. So important. We could probably talk about just that and go into a whole show, right? And so there are, whole pod, there are podcasts who only focus on mindfulness meditation. Yeah. So there's a ton of those out there as well. People are like, how can I learn more about those? Yeah, I bet you've got some information like that available somewhere too. Yes. <laughs> uh -huh. How about your website at, at abcdefg.q, whatever it was, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'll post it for real later. We'll talk about That's it. That's awesome. Yeah. All right. Any more, any more on stress tolerance? <laughs> um, you know, our amygdala is a freaky thing. Amygdala is part of Is that what's at the back of my throat, that little wing, that little thing yeah. right there? That's, That's my... your uvula. That's oh, amazing. sorry. Not my amygdala. Okay. That's my... okay. <laughs> it's your amygdala is in your brain. It's that reptilian part of your brain that, you know, it just stores all of our reactions to things that made us react. And so stress is one of those things that triggers your amygdala into reaction mode. So the more we can do things that um, amp up oxytocin, which is our love hormone. So acts of kindness. Oh, I got the love hormone. Fine. I no know, either. right? So oh, when no. I just think about your work that you put out into the stratosphere, into the atmosphere, into our lives, like it's a dose after dose after dose of oxytocin release. And so we need to be doing things intentionally to amp up that love hormone, which mm. is you know, connection with people, of course, the ones we can physically touch right now because of COVID. Get your love space on with those family members and friends that are in your bubble. But even consider how easy it is to drop notes of kindness around your neighborhood, to um, pull someone's garbage bins up on a garbage day for them, yeah, right? Yeah. Like it's so easy to integrate acts of kindness, which fills our cup and it fills their cup and that cycle just keeps feeding itself and that is maybe the best way to manage our stress on a regular basis i love it i'm taking notes to my neighborhood you just inspired me gonna do it i'm gonna talk to my one? i love that one yeah family one time i'm gonna have my kids my we're all gonna come up with something write it down thing and i'm gonna take them to all the mailboxes in the neighborhood that's awesome yeah beautiful right your kids would probably love drawing a picture and just putting like just drawing a picture and signing it with their name and oh my god i can't wait i can't wait for your neighbors to like grab oh it's gonna be i know i'm stoked this is gonna happen i'm telling you right now i'm glad we just did this that's a great idea i love it because it's gonna mm -hmm. give some people just a moment of wow and i'm not even gonna put down it was from us it just we're gonna write stuff down just put it out there anonymously right oh, Nice. Nice. That's the best way. Man, I love that. And that whole love bubble thing you just talked about, I'm going to tell that totally to my wife. Look, I've got my love bubble on, honey. So Aww. come on, let's, let's have some love. She <laughs> never, depends on what kind of bubble she wants to put on. <laughs> she said, no. She said, I'm social distancing from you. Oh, 20, 27 feet. <laughs> <laughs> All right, which, which leads me into assertiveness. Yeah. No, no, no. My love bubble's on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and not the, not the same kind of, well, maybe, maybe it does allude to something like that, but we could probably take this assertiveness thing into back to the road rage thought process, but we'll get to that yeah. in a second. So, so now we're moving into assertiveness. Number four, we talked about impulse control, flexibility, uh, stress tolerance, and now we're at assertiveness. Number four. Number four. And oftentimes assertiveness is confused with aggression. Mm, like well. people, think being, people think being assertive is when people are aggressive and they're directive and they're authoritative and you're like no that is not what it means so assertiveness is how we communicate our feelings our beliefs our thoughts our personal values and our personal rights in a socially acceptable way which means it's non-offensive it's non-destructive wait a minute wait a minute wait a minute, minute, minute. what'd you just say i don't how's that what huh I mean, this is 2020, and I, girl, I got my, I got my rights. You got your rights. Just like, so for example, I love the example of driving a car because most people can relate to that right out of the gates, right? And we think about, well, what do we do? We might 
Im impulse control now, if it's low, we might say something out loud. We might give the gesture. We might um, hit our accelerator and speed up. Like we might veer around them and cut them off. We might do all of these sort of aggressive behaviors. All she of them. She just gave me the finger. I'm like, I'm trying not to laugh. I was like, oh, oh Teresa right. just, just flipped me off. I love but it. Look, all of them socially unacceptable, all of them yeah. offensive, all of them destructive, right? So we think about, wait, so now how do I assert myself in a way that is the opposite to that? Gosh, because somebody flips you off. I mean, that doesn't just make you think like, love bubble. <laughs> I want to show no, you my love. it doesn't. But if I'm angry and I fly off the handle in expressing my anger, if that's my go-to, then eventually people are just like, well, there's Teresa flying off the handle again. And they're not listening anymore. And my anger becomes something they are desensitized to. Mm. So we have to learn in those sort of extreme emotional triggers and experiences. We have to learn. We can have the emotional experience. We have to learn how to harness it and communicate it. That is what assertiveness really is. We have to communicate the gravity of the situation. We have to- To who, ourselves or to other people? How are you? Well, assert, we're, your assertiveness is usually the communication outward of what we're experiencing. If we think even in the workplace and in leadership, it's when someone behaves badly, violates an expectation, performs poorly, or, or breaks a promise. And so we're upset. And now we're going to go tell them we're upset. And I'm not going to be flexible. I'm not going to shift my mood to being happy and going, hey, you look great today. I just wanted to tell you, you really shit the bed on that expectation. Maybe you could do better next time. And they're just like, what the heck was that? Yeah. <laughs> no, I've got to go in and I have to say, Matt, you totally botched the expectation. I cannot, like right now, I am angry at, the fact that you didn't speak to me, you didn't communicate with me what was going on, you didn't, 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 and we set up all of these expectations in advance. What happened? And so I have to ground it in the emotion with the correct expression. How I did that, that was socially acceptable. I didn't name call, I didn't raise my voice, I didn't blame him for anything. I used facts, observable facts. We had an expectation, and then I invited you into the conversation. What happened? In that moment, if the other person is like, uh, that's okay, let them own their own emotional response. You don't have to be responsible for how they now feel about the fact that you're calling them on breaking an expectation. Mm. That, by the way, is your job as a manager. It's yeah. often even our job as a parent. Yeah, you're so right. I can, I can tell that I've failed many times in that arena. Uh, and what you just said a second ago is just highlighting it again. You know, one of the first things you said was, I'm angry, I'm angry with dump, 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 which you didn't say, you are, um, I, I'm so mad at you because you did blah, blah, blah. You said, I'm angry with, and it was certain things, which were the, the failures or the mishaps or whatever happened, that bottom line, somebody was not supposed to do in the first place. They were hired to do this, this, and this, and you did this and this. So it's, it's within le legal bounds of the, of the conversation. Happened? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. So, but happened? you presented it in a way, obviously, yes, that would be or should be received socially acceptable. Like you didn't downplay me. You're not talking down to me, right? You're just trying to invite somebody into conversation and say, I'm trying to understand what, what happened here, right? So let's have this yeah. conversation. Yeah, that's really yeah. good. And someone's initial response to that approach might not be like, oh, let me tell you what happened. And they're totally cool. We'll see the social cues that they get that they're in, quote unquote, in trouble. They get that they let us down. We'll see their emotions rise. And that is okay. Let them have it. This is not a 30 second conversation. Our emotions will adjust as the conversation continues. It's meant to adjust because we're meant to end in a space where the choice of my decision to have this conversation and express my emotions was to strengthen our relationship. If my choice was to do anything other than that as an outcome, then I don't express the anger. So I only choose to express anger if the reason and intention I'm doing it is to make our relationship stronger. If I'm doing it to belittle you, to demean you, to use my power and authority, this is not the time for me to express anger. 
Because no, in this case, you're talking about a person who's had most likely the opportunity to prepare for the conversation, yeah, um, yeah. not a an immediate response to something. Right. This is a this is a situation where you've had a chance to think about something and, and come, which is a great great opportunity as leaders to or parents or, or anybody spouses whatever to, mm -hmm. to to take on some of these characteristics to go into those conversations but then there are those moments where I don't know you're in the office and you're next to the person and that person's mm -hmm. on the phone with a client and that person says um, you know yeah I appreciate the sales but you know you suck I mean, I can't believe that you didn't, you didn't buy more from me this time. You bought it from the other company down the street. I mean, how would you do that? Blah, 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 whatever. Click. <laughs> then you, right. you're watching the person on the phone that just did that. And immediately you have to go into some kind of conversation. So it's so hard to say, all right, all right I need to think about that. So <laughs> you got to go. Uh, when you're not emotionally intelligent and you haven't practiced it, it's hard, Matt. But that is the practice journey is eventually it doesn't, you don't need the time. Eventually, you know how to harness that. It becomes that second know, nature is what you're saying. And, and if, yes, you develop the skill set. It becomes second nature. In the meantime, you might need impulse control. So this is how we cycle around. We circle around to this first skill we talked about. You might need to give yourself a breath or two or five or six <laughs> <laughs> and ask yourself. Um, all right, Paul, I need to tell you something real fast. Um, ask breathe. yourself a couple questions around intention so you want to direct your focus to your intention and away from your emotion immediate so you can regulate the emotion what do i want for me what do i want for them what do i want for us and when i answer those kinds of questions then i can approach with the correct intention if i can't answer those questions i'm not ready to have the conversation i might have to say that call you just had we need to have a conversation and i'd like to schedule that for two o'clock this afternoon mm, yeah you buffer. give yourself the buffer time you need. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and the and other person know, at the same you know, time. The other person right. going to have to own it at the same time, right? Yes. It's like you're calling them on it immediately, but you're not discussing it immediately. And so they also get the opportunity to go, oh, I got to prep for that conversation. What am I going to say? <laughs> yeah. Ooh, I blew it yeah. that time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, that's fantastic. I love it. Man, that's really good. So we've talked about impulse control, um, flexibility, stress tolerance, assertiveness, um, the love bubble. I'm talking about that yeah. a little bit. Yeah, I'm sorry. I love to go there. Um, That's great. And then, and then road rage, which is a great example uh, of mm -hmm. all this put, put together. Um, I mean, this is just fantastic. So obviously, we in 30 minutes, however long we've been on here, well, one, I think there's some fantastic information, and people can just pause and go back or write down, take notes, whatever. It's great, great stuff. Right. Thank you, Teresa, for sharing all this. Uh, but there's way more to this than just 30 minutes, and it takes a bit of time in life. And I'm sure there's way more than these four points we've talked about when it comes down to, you know, applying emotional intelligence uh, and, and really expounding upon all these things. We talked about mindfulness, mindset, so, you know, all these other areas, um, which is really just that's your that's your field. It's your play field where you where you live and it's what you do. Uh, and you work with a lot of uh, executives and companies, CEOs, things of that nature and, and individuals, I'm sure, as well. Uh, mm -hmm. like like me you just helped me out right so i wish i appreciate so how can folks i mean if they want to do something like that with you or or find a way to to do that with their company or whatever the case may be i mean what does that look like that kind of relationship how do they start that with you how do you implement some of these things is it a webinar is it a seminar is it a clinic a workshop how, tell us how that looks what that looks like Yes, to all of those things. And it always begins with a discovery call, right? So a conversation about what are you currently experiencing? What are the goals? What are you aiming for? What are the pain points? What are your observation of what's going on that you don't want things that you do want? So we get into a discovery call, which is usually about an hour long. And in that process is the, the statement of work, if you will. So what are we going to need to do to achieve those kinds of goals that growing an emotionally intelligent organization or individual grows? And that's when we start to look at executive 360 EQI profiling and assessments with feedback and one-on-one -on -one coaching. We look at the leadership excellence program through emotional intelligence, which is a 12 month program that I have. It's my signature program that I use in organizations. We look at running webinars for the employee base, workshops for the employee base, we also look at something that's critical to do is you can do all of this work, but if your internal processes of how you hire, how you promote, 
how you performance manage stay the same, then you're just going to undo all of the work we've been doing to build an emotionally intelligent organization. So we have to integrate emotional intelligence into your internal processes. So, you know, we measure performance on these metrics and on these emotional intelligence skills. So we have to be integrating it into our culture, which includes how we run our business. Mm, so good. And I would assume now with, uh, with COVID, yeah. um, as bad as it may be, you know, for so many people, unfortunately, mm -hmm. um, there, there are opportunities for you to be able to do probably even more now with uh, staff and people in, in, uh, in corporations, businesses, whatever, um, be able to do um, group calls, um, individual one-on-one -on -one stuff, things of that nature. If you're hired by XYZ Corporation, they've got 100 people or whatever. So you can go through stuff like that and offer those types of services now as well. Um, what you were doing before, but probably even more so now, right? Yeah, the one that is most popularly requested is intentional well being, like flourishing through crisis. So, uh, helping people to understand four pillars of well being under emotional intelligence. And I'm actually offering a free one hour session on August 25th at 11 a.m. on intentional well being. Oh man, that's amazing. So give me some more information details on that. So when you're talking, I can in the editing time or like down, down there somewhere. Yeah. So this one hour webinar is interactive. My webinars, I hate attending webinars that are like a sales pitch. So, you know, they, they talk yes. about problems and then they just sell you for 45 minutes. Oh, that drives me like talk about the rage meter growing. <laughs> <laughs> this is where we so, get to see Teresa in action. Yeah. So what's kind of interesting is I know that that's a trigger for me. So in the first five minutes, you can tell a webinar is like that. I just hang up instead of experience, like staying it and experiencing it. Why would I do that? I know what this is, not my cup of tea. And I just hang up and I leave. So wow, my yeah. webinars are interactive. You know, my, my life impact, you named it earlier. You know, this is my zone of genius, my spiral of genius, which means that this is where I'm in flow. This space is where all of my talents and strengths and passions and what I'm good at, what I'm interested in, this is where it all lives. Yeah. And so for me, the goal is impact. However, I can get EQ into other people's hands, make it accessible so that they're doing it on a regular basis means everybody benefits because there's no way that I can work with everyone on the planet. So I need to be able to offer it in ways that's accessible. And so I like to run free webinars, usually a couple times during the month, so that people can come in. And especially with intentional well-being, they get four critical EQ skills with very practical, actionable things to be doing right out of the gates. If they only Amazing. do one of them, they're already better, right? Um, yeah. And so that's what people will experience in the hours. They'll, it's a pen down, get to work, stop talking, listen, go, do, do, do. Let's ask some questions in and out in the hour where people kind of leave and go, holy crap, that was a lot of stuff. And I wrote a whole, <laughs> I wrote a lot of stuff down and often leads to like the next engagement where companies are, could you come in and run this? Can we talk about what your leadership program is? Because all of a sudden that hour unlocks the power of emotional intelligence development. Mm, that's so good. So how can people right now plug into that, that webinar that's coming up? So on my website, the registration is on the events tab. You just register, get yourself, get your spot, get your spot saved for the event. And um, I'll be promoting on LinkedIn. I'll just put the whole link to attend that day. If you don't want to register in advance, but it's kind of nice if I know how many people are coming. Yeah, no doubt. And that was that, EQ, IQ, e, 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 T, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, what yeah. was it again? Tell me, tell me, tell me. IQ, <laughs> EQ, TQ, dot com. IQ, EQ, TQ. IQ, EQ, TQ. Hey, IQ, EQ, TQ, dot com. IQ, EQ, TQ, dot com. Hey, I got it right now. I'm I love it. I love it. I'll never forget that now. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, it's so great. So they can go there right now and they can click on that. And by the way, you did mention that this is not just a one-time only deal. You are, you are doing some things uh, repetitively. You've got some other webinars you do quite, quite frequently to help pour this out into, into the community, into the world. Wow, so fantastic. That's one thing I love about Teresa. She's an amazing, amazing gal. I love that. Thanks, so if Matt. you're not emotionally intelligent, then you're, you're unemotionally ignorant, I guess. So if you don't want to be unemotionally ignorant anymore, 
like me, then uh, you want to try some more emotional intelligence. I try to do my emotional intelligence as much as I can. Um, I'm, I'm a work in progress. I am work progress. Y'all are. Yeah, we are. Good Lord. My wife will tell you I'm not there yet, but I'm, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Uh, You're walking so, the path. Um, so my problem is, hey, this is another thing. Boy, if we can go to another show, it'd be, be fantastic. But, you know, I'm on, I take about 32 pills a day for all my cancer junk that I have to go through. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I know that the medication affects my, my uh, personality and my reactions, mm -hmm. things of that nature, where I can snap quickly, angry, you know, all those types of things. I'm aware that's mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it just goes anyway, and that's just what it is. And you're like, ah, oh, crap, you know? And then other times it's like, stop <laughs> the madness. I know something's, I know this is about to happen and it's, I don't want to do this, but holy smokes, right? I'm not the only person on the planet has to deal with that. Um, some people aren't even medicated and have to deal with that, but, um, yeah, there are times that medications, and you you talk about with nutrition, different things of that nature, um, they can interfere with things like this happening. For example, mm -hmm. if you have, um, I don't know, let's say you're you're over overweight, and maybe you have diabetes or some things of that nature, then your chemicals are chemicals are imbalanced, and there's going to be ways you do things that you normally wouldn't do. If you're a person who's living in pain. And mm -hmm. that physical pain creates a, an emotional outburst of sorts, right? There's lots of things to talk about that yeah. where emotional intelligence can really come in and, and really help. Um, may, not, may not be the miracle for everything, but it sure does help level some things out, right? Yeah. Even the power of what you're talking about is so real. You consider how many um, adults and children are on the autism scale. And so behaviors that come out are not intended to harm. And yet someone does get harmed in, yes. in the behavior itself. And when we have emotional intelligence, what it does is it builds our own level of self-esteem. So that saying things like, I'm sorry, that's not what I intended, comes out very quickly with genuine sincerity. And that in and itself is an emotional intelligence recovery point when we respond in ways that we don't want to respond. And the more often we follow that cycle, the better we are at even catching ourselves in, in doing it. And, you know, sometimes you'll find yourself start the sentence and you'll cut yourself off. And the other person will be like, did you want to finish what you're saying? You're like, actually, no, I yeah. actually don't. It's why I stopped. Um, and I need a minute. <laughs> yes. And then you go brush and your teeth. You do you go brush your teeth and you think about what do I want for me? What do I want for them? What do I want for us? Yes. <laughs> yeah. How do I want to approach oh, this? Yeah. I love it. I love it, Teresa. Thanks so much for spending some time with us today and sharing this great stuff. I mean, it's so, so good of you. That's what I love about you. You're so awesome. And well, uh, I appreciate it. Oh, I'm so glad that we were able to do this. And uh, I can't yeah. wait for, uh, obviously, this is uh, going to go to folks here and get a chance to hear all this stuff. Um, before August 25th, because I want them to hear about signing up for this event. So I'm gonna make this happen as fast as possible. Um, but man, I love it again. So one more time for folks who out without me having some fun with it. Uh, one more time, just tell folks how they can get in touch with you. Um, and, you know, if you can just kind of go through, I've, I've alluded to it several times, but you know, who are your, your key people that you, you reach out to, right? Who are the people that are, are your, I hate to say your ideal client. But it's kind of that way, right? Who are those people that you really reach out to and how can they get in touch with you? So the best, the best way to be in touch, you know, any individual who just wants, I want more of this, follow me on LinkedIn because I'm producing content all the time. Subscribe to my YouTube page, which is just Teresa Quinlan. There's over 300 video clips on emotional intelligence, how to grow it, what it is, practical strategies. Like I said, Matt, I give a lot away for free because why not? Really? Yeah. I totally <laughs> and then agree. Corporations that are identifying, they want to be in the space of human first leadership, knowing we need to take care of our people because then the people can take care of the business. Those are my ideal clients, are the ones that are willing to step into the space of acknowledging that human beings are emotional beings first. And then we can access our intelligence. But if our emotions are at risk, if we are at risk, if we are unwell in our workplace, meaning trust doesn't exist, compassion is not around very much, psychological safety is kind of like iffy. <laughs> yeah. Then 
you can connect with me on LinkedIn and you can connect with me via my website or you can- At IQEQTQ.com, IQEQTQ.com. Ooh, I got it down now, girl. <laughs> Oh my God. I'll record that little snippet for you and you can have that one. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get lots of business now. Totally. <laughs> like a, the floodgates just opened. <laughs> and I so awesome. I kick back on that. That's right. I'll get a little, uh, yeah, we'll talk about the royalties <laughs> later off, off camera here. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thanks again, Teresa. I appreciate you being here with us today on Matt Chat Live. It's been so fantastic. And I'm, I'm passionate about sharing anything I can with the world too, to help make a difference. And, um, and that's a blessing to be able to have you to be a part of that, to share that you're already doing it. But, um, for me to be able to share that with some of the folks in, in my network that we actually share a bunch of that too, but, um, yeah. it's, it's great to give that out, uh, across the board. And again, if anybody needs her IQEQTQ.com is the greatest place to go to see this incredible woman named Teresa Quinlan. So thank you again so much for being with us today. Thank you, Matt. If you'd like to be a guest on Matt Chat Live and Matt Chat Live Dailies, please reach out to us here or visit us at mattcrump.tv. IQ, EQ, TQ. <laughs> Thank you. Thank it's you. It's got a rhythm. I love it. I love it. It's so good. It's so good. <laughs>